And so what they'll do is they'll come in and they will train, they'll teach a lot of times the staff, the bartenders, the cooks, etc. They don't have any training. So it's kind of their fault, but not really their fault that they don't know what they're doing. So these experts will do the training and then on the way out, if they keep in place what John Taffer and his, his group, his, his uh, partners, if they keep in place what changes they've made, success almost always happens. Now, sometimes the owner, if it's, if it's my bar, and oh, I don't, I don't like what he did with the place, I'm gonna paint it a different color. I'm gonna do something different. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But on the way out, Taffer, he has given some training and he has given a vote of confidence. You guys can do it, you've been trained. Now just keep going and you're gonna make it. You're gonna make it. <clears throat> the work is ahead. Taffer leaves, his group leaves. The group is ahead, but they're ready. They're equipped, they've been trained, they have a vote of confidence, they are ready to go. Same is true for what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, Jeremiah, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I'd invite you to open up to Jeremiah chapter 1. But uh, Jeremiah is an Old Testament prophet, and he is called and subsequently equipped by the Lord. Now we'll look at the origins of his calling, we'll look at his calling, and to see how it pertains through seven different points, as you can see in your bulletin. So, just a small caveat before we go too far, but often, sometimes we'll read scripture, and we will almost, we'll have the temptation to strike out the name that's there and replace it with our own. Now, this is not the story of Kenyan Sibyls. This is not your story. This is the story of Jeremiah. And the vision and the words and the event that is happening, these things did not happen to you. This message is unique to Jeremiah. But, but that being said, the Lord in his sovereign grace, the Lord in his mercy, he speaks to us and he empowers us. And that is what we're going to approach today. <clears throat> now I give that little caveat part to keep myself on track, but also for us to remember that it's not about you, it's not about me. As we read the Bible, it, this is about Jeremiah. Eventually, and we'll flush it out as I said, we can see how we can apply it to our lives. But it's not about you. It's not about me. So that being said, let's read, we're going to read verses 4 through 10. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Alas, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak because I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am a youth, because everywhere I send you, you shall go, and all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. So, the first part is, it comes from verses 4 and 5, and that God speaks to us. God speaks to you, God speaks to me, God speaks to us. And from these verses, uh, <clears throat> in verse 4 it says, Now the word of the Lord came to me saying. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying. Now why is that important? Why is that important? I'm sure you've experienced times of your life when you felt like God was ignoring you. Lord, all these things are going on and you don't even hear me. You don't care. You're ignoring me. You hate me. God's been silent. God's been silent. And the tendency, at least in my life, perhaps for you as well, God appears to be most silent when we would rather him talk to us 
and a message across the sky. Kenyon, this is what I want you to do. Or the bush to catch fire and say, Kenyon, this is, you're, you're wrong. This is good. what's right. That's what we want. That's what we want. But <clears throat> oftentimes, and that hasn't happened to me. Maybe it's happened to you. It's so awesome. Good for you. Um, even though those things don't always happen, the Lord does hear. And the Lord does speak. Even though sometimes he is silent or he doesn't speak as quickly as we might want him to, the Lord does speak to us. Now, how does God speak? How does God speak? The Lord came to me saying, oftentimes he does not speak audibly like he did for Jeremiah. Some, as I said, these things may have happened to you and that's great. I've never heard the Lord audibly speaking as you can hear me audibly speaking. <clears throat> but God speaks to us through his word, which is why it's important for us to be reading it more than just Sunday morning. God speaks to us through prayer, which is why it's, more, it's important for us to be praying more than Sunday morning, more than when we're about to eat our food. God speaks to us through other people and through life situations. God speaks to us in different ways. Now, sometimes our problem is we're not listening. We're too busy, frantically running around, frantically freaking out about nothing. And when we're doing those things, we don't hear the Lord speaking. Or as I said, if we're not in prayer, if we're not reading our Bibles, we will not, we'll miss the Lord speaking to us. Um, maybe if you drove up... Um, I think it's 4th Street, you saw we have a new truck for our thrift store. We just bought a new truck for the store a week and a half ago. And <clears throat> before, this is actually the third truck that we were potentially going to buy. The first one was last year, and it would have been a brand new truck. would have been about $45,000. Now... I believe personally that the Lord spoke to me later um, with the gentleman we were going to purchase the truck through. Bad communication on my part and then bad communication on his part. It was just a mess. It was a mess. And I think that the Lord prevented that sale from going through because we did not need a truck that was worth $45,000. We did not need a brand new truck. <clears throat> Later, the Lord revealed, Kenyon, I did not let this happen because you didn't need it. I had something better for you. But I was not listening. I was not praying and saying, Lord, what's going on? And then to take the time to listen. I prayed all the time for a truck. I prayed that the things would go through. Lord, let this go through. Whatever needs to happen, let it happen. I prayed, but I didn't listen. Had I been listening, the Lord would have revealed, like he did later, I have something better. I have something better. The Lord spoke and revealed that he, was, he protected me. He had something better. The first thing is that the Lord speaks to us. The second thing is that God knows us intimately. Look at verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Now, I will never be a mother. I will never birth a child. Um, that being said, I think the coolest concept to me, I don't remember the first time I heard it, but the, one of the coolest concepts to me is, uh, was it, it's, it's skin time? Is that what it's called? Or skin to skin time? When, you're when you first have your baby and um, you either take your shirt off or open your chest or whatever, and they're just laying on your skin. Um, one of my friends, him and his wife just had a child, and he was having skin time with his son. And it's just such a cool concept and the chance for the baby to bond with you, to know you intimately. Um, I think nursing mothers, they have a leg up. They get to have the chance to bond with their child, with their son or their daughter. Um, but even for mothers who don't nurse, it's a, I think it's the mom thing. Um, guys were kind of at a disadvantage. But that being said, the chance to know your child, your baby, intimately. 
God knows us intimately. Before, <clears throat> he says to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before that point, I consecrated you. I set you apart. Now, what are the implications of this, of God knowing us intimately? When you are sitting alone, doing things you shouldn't be doing, lusting, gambling, gossiping, those kinds of things, the Lord knows. When you're with your friends, when you are bad-mouthing your spouse, your husband, your wife, your friends, oh, that guy, he's so stupid. Oh, my wife, she's such an idiot. The Lord knows. When you're sitting in church wishing Lieutenant Kenny would shut up, the Lord knows. He knows our hearts. He knows us intimately. Before you were conceived, just as with Jeremiah, as I said, this is for Jeremiah, but before we were conceived, the Lord knew how wicked and ugly your hearts would be. But before you were conceived and knowing and knowing how wicked and ugly our hearts would be, the Lord loved you deeply. Even knowing how wicked our hearts would be, he loved us passionately enough to go to the cross for us. Consider, I mentioned it earlier, Psalm 139. Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14, it says, For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. Wonderful are your works. Psalm 139, the whole thing, if you want something to meditate on, Psalm 139 is excellent. We cannot hide from God. We cannot hide. Though we might try, though sometimes we might act like, Oh, Lord, I don't want you to see what I'm doing. The Lord sees. The Lord knows. He knows our hearts. He knows our actions. He knows our words. God knows the deepest part of you. <clears throat> he knows us intimately. The third is that God gives us a purpose. Now, what was Jeremiah's purpose? What was Jeremiah's purpose? Jeremiah's purpose was to be a prophet to the nations. He says, see, I have appointed you, verse 10, see, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up and to break down. Verse, <clears throat> verse 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you, set you apart for what? To uh, uh, appointed you a prophet to the nations. God set him apart for that specific reason. Now, we see this in other parts of the Bible. Some people, they have a specific purpose that you can read that's revealed to them in Scripture. Um, Paul, Paul, um, he was revealed, or he was set apart, consecrated to share the gospel with the Gentiles. It says that in the book of Acts. He was to share the gospel with the Gentiles. John the Baptist. His purpose was to be a forerunner for the Messiah. Uh, it talks about that in the Gospels, but it was first talked about in Isaiah, in Malachi. It talks about it a little bit too. He was to be a forerunner for whomever this Messiah would be, to go before Jesus, to go before the Messiah and to make the path straight. Some in the Bible, they have had their purpose told to them specifically. So that being said, do you have a purpose? Do you have a purpose? Since your name is not, re or at least relating to you personally, your name is not found in the Bible, do you have a purpose? Yes, you do. You absolutely have a purpose. Now, the cool thing about the Bible, maybe you've realized this, maybe you haven't, everything in the Old Testament, everything in the Old Testament, points to Christ. And then everything after the Gospels in the New Testament points back to Christ. It is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. <clears throat> Jeremiah was a prophet. One, a prophet is one who speaks the words of God to a specific people that God would reveal. Jeremiah was a prophet. His role was to point people towards repentance if you read the book of Jeremiah, you'll see you guys need to repent or you're about to get wiped out. 
Jeremiah's role was to point people towards repentance, to go back to God where they once were. Jeremiah, though, he was a signpost. He was a signpost. He's someone who not only pointed to God, but would model what the Messiah would do. If you remember, if you look in the Gospels, what were Jesus' first words? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He called people to repentance, just as Jeremiah did, just as many before him did as well. What is your purpose? What is your purpose? We are post-resurrection Christians. I mentioned that before. We are post-resurrection Christians. Our role, this is very important, our role and our purpose is defined by the life and death of Christ. Say that again. You, me, we being post-resurrection Christians, the resurrection of Christ has already happened. We being post-resurrection Christians, our role and our purpose is defined by the life and death of Christ. Because without it, we are nothing. Without it, we are nothing. The cross of Christ makes the difference in your life and mine because without it, you have no purpose on this earth. If you call yourself a Christian. If you call yourself a Christian. What is your purpose? Your purpose is to make much of Christ at all times, in all ways. Make much of Christ. That is why you're on earth. Now, what does that look like? What does that look like? It might look different, a little bit different for you than it does for me. For this guy than for that lady, whatever. But similar to Jeremiah, similar to Jeremiah, that looks like you speaking, you have to open your mouth, speaking and sharing about Christ. It is not enough. It is absolutely not enough. As you think about your purpose, why are you on earth? Why are you here? It is not enough for you to do Christian things and to be a good person and to act like Christ with the hopes that someone will ask you about it. It's simply not enough because not all, not all people are loud mouths like me. A lot of people won't ask you. A lot of people won't. Some might. Well, hey, Hey, why are you different? Why are you doing this thing? And that's excellent. The Bible says, if that does happen, be ready to share. But it is not enough for us to do Christian things, to act like a good person, to act like Christ with the hopes that someone will ask us about it. Those things are good. But we have a message to share as well. We have a message to speak. Now, who do you speak to? Who do you say these things to? Your friends. Tell them to your friends. Tell them to your family. The woman who's standing behind you at the grocery store. Tell it to her. The guy who is sitting next to you at the doctor's office. Tell him. Tell everybody. You share Christ with the world. Share Christ with the world. The third thing is that God gives us a purpose. And it would do you very well to remember it. Now, one of the cool things about God, the fourth thing is that there are no age limits with God. God doesn't care about age. In the Bible, examples abound. A lot of examples of where God uses people who are young. Um, King Uzziah, if you look, you don't have to turn there, but write it down if you want, you can flip. Um, Second Corinthians chapter, Second Chronicles, excuse me. Second Chronicles chapter 26. There's a guy named Uzziah who becomes king. Uzziah was 16 years old. Now, Chance, I'm going to pick on you for a second. Can you imagine running this country? (coughs) Can you guys imagine? What would you think? All right, today is February 22nd. Tomorrow, Chance is in charge of us all. (laughs) I'm moving to Canada. I'm just kidding. That'd be crazy. That'd be crazy. A 16-year-old running the the place. Even crazier, maybe. 2 Chronicles chapter 34. Josiah was 8 when he became king. All right. So, Atreyu is king now. Atreyu, you ready? You're running the place. Whatever you say goes. 
You guys ready for that? <laughs> An eight-year-old. God uses young people. On the flip side, though, God uses old people. Ernie, I won't pick on you. I know how old you are, but you don't have to share it with the rest of us. Um, can you imagine having a son right now? <laughs> Abraham was 100 years old when he had his son Isaac. 100 years old. I know you're not 100 yet, so you got a few years until... Well, congratulations, it's a boy. Crazy, right? God uses things that we think are crazy, like an 8-year-old to be king, or a 100-year-old man to have a son who would, have, who would be in the line of Christ. Paul... Paul was a preacher, he was an evangelist, he was a mentor to Timothy. He was a traveling um, missionary as an old man. Age does not matter. Age doesn't matter. Excuses, whether speaking ability, you think about Moses, Lord, I can't do these things because I can't talk. Or age, I'm too young, I can't go, I'm, a, I'm just a youth, Jeremiah says. Or something else, these things are nothing to God. They are nothing to God. He is able to take broken, incapable vessels and to use them in magnificent ways for his glory. <clears throat> now, think about this. All right, think about this. You have, or in my hands is nothing. If I, from, from what everything is in my hands, if I was able to make cash, cash, I would have everything I need. If I could make things out of nothing. If you had the gift to make something, cash, food, whatever, from nothing, you, one, you'd be very rich, but two, you could have just about anything. Make something out of nothing. That's what God did. God, he's, he's there. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Just made it. There was nothing, and he made it. Then he made the sky and the, and the sun and the, and the uh, water and the animals, etc., etc., out of nothing. Now, if God can make those things out of nothing, if he can make the earth a blade of grass, a mountain, what could God do in your life? What could God do in your life? He takes broken vessels. He takes incomplete vessels and uses them in magnificent ways. God can use your life, whether you are old or young, in a magnificent way. Age does not matter for God. <clears throat> the fifth thing is that God gives us a message to preach. He gives us a message. Now in Jeremiah's case, the message he would send the message he would send is what God would give him at the time, okay? Going over here, Lord, what do I say to these people? Blah, 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 blah. Going over here, what do I say to these people? God give it to me, okay? Blah, 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 blah. He gives it to, he gave it to him when he needed it. You find that often in the Old Testament. Lord, I'm here, what do you want me to say? Okay, say it. Okay, Lord, I'm here, etc. In the New Testament, though, the message people, that's not usually how it happened in the New Testament. In the New Testament, People talked about Christ. They talked about who he was, what he did, what he did for them. What message do you preach? You have a purpose. What message do you preach? What is your message? We preach that Jesus has come into the world and was killed at the hands of men for the forgiveness and the redemption of souls. Why was he killed? So you could be forgiven. So your soul could be redeemed. We preach that the creator of all the world, he cares about you. So many people, hopefully you know that someone cares about you. But a lot of people in this world, they do what they do because they don't think that anyone gives a darn about them. With our love as Christians, we need to tell them, yes, I care about you, but also that the God of the universe, the one who created the world, cares about them. Enough to leave heaven for them. Enough to die a brutal murder on the cross for them. 
We preach that. We preach Romans 5, 8. While we were still sinners, while you were in your sin, Christ died for you. While we were sinners, not, oh, well, I got to get all nice and I got to stop and I got to be all good and stuff. No, no. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We echo the words. What do we preach? We echo the words of the woman who was caught in adultery in John chapter 8. When Jesus says, where are your accusers? She says, they're gone. Jesus said, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Jesus, when we approach him because of the cross, he gives us grace. He gives us mercy because he loves us. That is what we preach. We preach love to a world full of hate. We preach love to those who know no love. The, the fifth thing from Jeremiah's origin and his calling is that God gives us a message to preach. The sixth thing, and this one might be important for many of us today. It's the fact that God gives confidence. God gives confidence. Now, I mentioned <clears throat> the, that show, and as he's walking out the door, John Taffer, he says to the owner, hey, you got this. You got this. Just stay true. Don't get lazy. Just stay true, and you have this. You'll keep making your money back. He gives them a vote of confidence. God does all these nice things, gives us a purpose and a message, etc. But it can be very scary without confidence. When Gabe starts walking, Sarah, because she's a good mom, will say, you can do it. You can do it. When he gets on his bike for the first time, you can do it. You can do it. And that confidence will mean everything to him. It will mean everything to him. If from now... If from now she were to say, you're stupid and you can't do it, you're ugly. If she were to say those things, that would, he would have no confidence. He'd have no confidence down the road when he gets to Atreyu's age, when he gets to Chance's age, when he gets to my age. It'll be a mess because he doesn't have the confidence necessary. Doing something for the first time, it can be very scary. When he gets ready to get on that bike, it might be scary. He might fall down. He probably will fall down. Scrape his knee, scrape his elbow, etc. It can be scary. But once he's been on it a couple times, he will know more and more how to ride the bike, how to go a little faster, maybe how to jump off or anything. Well, we won't go there. But um, confidence comes when you do it more and more. Jeremiah had never been in the position that God was asking him to go. He never said, okay, Lord, this is the night time I've spoken to these people. I know what's going on. Just give me the words. No. If you remember, he said, I can't speak. I'm too young. I can't speak because I'm a youth. Verse 6. <clears throat> but look at what God says to him. Look at what God says to him in verse 8. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. I am with you. That is confidence. That is confidence. You don't have to be afraid because I will be with you. Does that mean that it wasn't hard? No. If you read Jeremiah, you know that he had a tough go of it. But God was with him in the middle of it. God gave that same promise to Joshua. As he's following Moses' footsteps, getting ready to lead the Israelites in the promised land. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9, it says, Be strong and very courageous. Why? Because the Lord your God goes with you wherever you go. Because the Lord your God goes with you wherever you go. Uh, we... Again, post-resurrection Christians, we can have that same confidence. Why? Acts 1.8 says, you will receive power. Jesus is talking. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. We get the Holy Spirit when we become Christians. We get the Holy Spirit. We will receive power because of the Holy Spirit. He is who helps us. 
He is the one who helps us. He is with us. Well, those of us who are Christians anyway. He is with those of us who are Christians wherever we go. Wherever we go. Now, why do I say this regarding confidence? God allows us to experience uncomfortable situations. When, you, when it feels like your world's going to hell, everything's falling apart, sometimes we may wonder, Lord, what are you doing? Where are you? Do you even, do you even hear me? I'm crying out to you. Where are you? He's there. I promise he's there. And I know that might not feel warm and fuzzy. That might not immediately remove you from the circumstances. God is there. For those of us who are Christians, we have the Holy Spirit. He is the one who will go through those pitfalls with us. It takes some practice to remember because, as I said, when we are in the middle of a frantic situation, that is where our focus is, understandably. But God is going through it with you. It is good for us to think about that, to remember that, to train our minds to think about that. Take confidence in the fact that God is with us at all times. The last thing to gather from Jeremiah's origin uh, is that God equips us he equips us with tools and a mission. God gives us tools and he gives us a mission. Look at verse 9. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, verse 10. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms. How was Jeremiah equipped? The Lord touched his mouth. The Lord touched his mouth and gave him words to speak. What else would he need? He doesn't need anything else. The Lord touched his mouth. The Lord gave him the words. God gave Jeremiah the mission to go and to speak what he would command. In Matthew 28, we'll talk about it next week, but God gives us the mandate to go and make disciples. That is our mission. What is the, what is, uh, the mission? Go and make disciples. We've already established the fact that being Christ followers makes us disciples. So this mandate is for us as well. That's for us as well. For Jeremiah, God gave him tools and a mission. So what are your tools? How are you supposed to do this? I mean, unless the Lord touches your mouth, which he might. <clears throat> Some with the material, as Melissa mentioned, we will equip you, we'll help equip you with tools if you come next week. But more than that, one of the tools is your mouth and your ability to say to your friends, to your family, hey, come to my church. Come to my church. That is a tool. The Lord has given you vocal cords and a tongue and a mouth to say, come to my church. God will speak through your invitation. Your, your friends might laugh at you in your face. Are you kidding me? I'm not going to church. You're stupid. The Lord will speak to them when you say, hey, it might be good for you to come. Hey, guy. Hey, lady. It might be good for you to come. The Lord will speak. He'll speak. <clears throat> Maybe you've said, oh, I don't know who I would share the gospel with. Even if I had the confidence, even if the Lord prepares me, I don't know who I would share with. I want to give you a thought. We're almost done, but I want to give you a thought. For those of you who work, for those of you who have a job, don't view your job as just a job. Don't view it as just something to make money. View it as a mission field. See your job as a mission field. And for those of you who don't have a job, your neighbors, your friends, that is not just your next door neighbor. It is a mission field. You're not just an employee. You're not just a neighbor. You are a missionary to the people who come into, that, into your work. You are a missionary to the people you work with. God wants to use you where you are. So listen. Listen to him. He wants to use you where you are. You. Yes, you. He wants to use you. There are people there who need your ministry. They need your love. They need your hope. They need your touch. When we see all of life, and the specific areas of our lives as avenues, as ways to share the gospel, 
the reality of evangelism, it's not so scary. I'm not going to the mission field. I'm going to work. I'm going to share Christ with my best friend at work. I'm going to ask them how they're doing. I'm going to tell them that Jesus loves them. I'm going to see how I can pray for them. Those are the tools you have. You already have them. So just to recap, if you're taking notes and you missed one, the first one is that God speaks to us. The second one is that God knows us intimately. Uh, God gives us a purpose. God does not adhere to age limits. He doesn't care about your age. He gives us a message. He gives us confidence for that message. And God equips us with tools and a mission. Now, I mentioned this earlier. If you read the book of Jeremiah, you know, I mean, Jeremiah, he's called the weeping prophet. The weeping prophet. Because when he went to speak to people, no one listened. When he went to speak to people, they didn't care. And so he was weeping, part because no one cared, part because he knew what was going to happen. They're going to get exiled. They're going to get wiped out. Ministry was tough for him. A time is coming for you. A time is coming for you when it's going to get harder than it is. Maybe you've shared the gospel with someone and they laughed at you. Maybe they said, if you tell those things to me again, I'll never talk to you again. Maybe you've shared that you've tried to talk to someone about Christ, but they've, they've just shut you down. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. People don't always listen, just like with Jeremiah. People don't always listen now. But for the sake of their soul, we have an obligation to share this message. We have an obligation. As we prepare to conclude, I, I, that's kind of a lot to throw at you, which is part why you have the op opportunity to take notes. But as we get ready to conclude, I want you to consider just a few statistics. Just a few statistics. Right now on this earth, there are 7.2 billion people. 7.2 billion people on this earth. And of that, there are at least, at least 5 billion who are not Christians. So we have 7.2. The vast majority are not Christians. That means 5 billion people who are at risk of going to hell. 5 billion people. For the sake of 5 billion people on this earth, consider your call to evangelism. To break it down, there are 22,000 people in Watertown. 22,000 people in Watertown. And the vast majority will tell you that they're Christians. But if you look at their lives, the vast majority, a lot of them are not. And that's not my word. That's just what the Bible, weighing their lives against what the Bible says. In the Gospels, Jesus told about a poor man named Lazarus who begged outside of a palace of a rich man. And when they both died, the poor man's in heaven and the rich man's in hell. And he looks up and he can see the, uh, Lazarus, the poor man. And he says, will you send Lazarus down to touch my tongue? Just a drop of water. Just a drop. Will you send him down to touch my tongue? He says, can't do that. Can't do that. Well, will you send him to tell my family? Because being down here is terrible. Will you send him down to warn my family? Can't do that. They've been warned. They've been warned. The prophets have come. Jesus has come. They've been warned. You are the one to warn your family. You are the one to warn your friends of the doom that will come. Because you, for, for, for those of you who are Christians, when you die, you'll go to heaven, and that will be great. But you are the one who might have family members. I have family members as well that I need to warn. You are the one to warn your family to say, you need to repent. You need to have Christ, because when you die, you will suffer long suffering, forever eternal agony. We're going to pray. We're going to pray, and as you ready your heart to pray, you have five billion people that you can pray for. Five billion people who are at risk of an eternity without Christ. There are thousands in Watertown 
who are at risk of an eternity without Christ. There are members of your family, perhaps, that are at risk of an eternity without Christ. Just as Jeremiah had the calling on his life, a specific calling, so too do you. You have a purpose. You have a mission. You have the tools to do it. You've been equipped by the Holy Spirit, by what Jesus did on the cross. To sit in church once a week and not share the gospel with anyone. To go about your life and to not pray for five billion who are at risk of eternity without Christ is to say, to hell with you. To hell with you. I don't care about you. To come to church, to not pray for them is to say, I don't care. So we're going to pray. And you pray for your family. You pray for Watertown. You pray for five billion who need to know Christ. And then in a second, I'll close. <clears throat> God calls. Just as he called you, he calls them. And God forgives just as he forgave you. Let's pray. <clears throat>